welcome to Face the Facts. It's great to have you all here once again. Happy April 1st, too. Our April 1st edition, April Fools. On today's show, we will talk about the um, exciting news uh, regarding the uh, Tom Brady. I don't know if any of you heard. Um, Tom Brady is going to um, be purchasing and bringing back to life the Montreal Expos, and he's going to be the first player coach um, that's going to be, he's going to be doing both. He's going to be playing both baseball and he's going to be doing the football thing. You know, not, nothing, nothing ceases to amaze me with Tom Brady. So we'll, we'll have a nice little discussion about that. All right. April fools. <laughs> you didn't let it go very long. I didn't let it go very long, but you know, it is what it no, is. No. Yeah. What was that? I blew it. <laughs> He was trying to trick you, Phil, and he just didn't, he didn't let it go. I mean, I guess. We will talk about the Bruins. We will talk about the Red Sox. We will talk about the Patriots. And then I really don't want to talk about the Celtics. So we'll leave that for another day. <laughs> no, we will. We will talk about the addition of Evan uh, Fournier. We'll talk about that. Um, I want to start with the Red Sox, though, first, because they would be playing opening day today. Um, but unfortunately, Mother Nature had other plans. So the Red Sox will be rained out for uh, their first game of the season. They will be playing um, Friday, Saturday, Sunday now. Um, they're opening up against the Baltimore Orioles at home. And I'm, uh, again, I'm still very optimistic about this team. Um, I think they're going to surprise a lot of people. And um, I think it's going to be a good thing for this team. But we'll have to see. I'll we'll have to wait another day. I think that's a big reason why things are going to go better than expected for this team is because of Cora being back with the Red Sox. I think, I think we'll see a lot of players have a good year. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, I don't know what you guys, any expectations on the Red Sox. So why don't we ask Tom first? Well, if he has any, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, expectations, predictions. I, I hope, I hope they'll be doing well, but, uh, I'm no, not, we're not going to see you, by the way, just to let you know. There you go. Unmute yourself, then start talking. Then I'll, then I'll mute Nick. Go for it. Um, oh, yeah, dude, you need a headset, man. You need a headset. Or Nick, turn down your volume right now. This is live and in color. All right, there you go. Yeah, we're doing Oh, oh you're hearing yourself? That's crazy. Is, is your is your volume down, Nick? Is it muted? I'm trying to figure out. Oh, I can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my God. There we go. All right. Go. So yeah, I mean, we're we're doing something new here. We we try to pull an April Fool's joke on everybody and just do a, a show right in the middle of uh, right in the same area, right in the same room. We're all in the same room. No. Um, Not me. I mean, I, I think I think they're looking good. I think we have, they have a good chance of doing well. Um, but the uh, <laughs> uh, I won't be able to watch. I won't be able to watch the Red Sox. So, I mean, I won't. I won't. I don't know. I don't know how my expectations need to be, but or how good my expectations are going to be. But I do think they're going to do well. Um, but yeah, I won't be able to watch them. So that kind of stinks. Phil, what do you think? Uh, well, you know, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. We'll see what happens. I might not be as entrenched in it at the beginning, but uh, I think, yeah, I think we're going to get something that's a little more, I don't know, exciting than usual. What? No one's going to see that, Nick. You're all muted. Hold on. Remove pin. Oh my god! Oh no, nope. cancel. Anyways, yeah, this show's all a mess. They, these two fools are trying to record something inside the same room. They don't understand the concept of volume or microphones <laughs> or echoing or any of that stuff. Uh, so, quick uh, lesson to everyone here: they won't be able to hear you now because you were muted. Because there you go. Uh, yeah, if you ever record something on Zoom in the same room, <laughs> someone has to have everything it. muted, and then the this other person. Yeah, I'll be, but a headset actually cures all the ails, this sort of thing. But yeah, I apologize. Yeah, I think the Red Sox are going to be great, uh, a lot better than people will give them credit for. I think they're going to work a lot harder. I think for Core, like we've said numerous times on this show, Core is the driving force for a lot of these people, for a lot of these players. And uh, I like him. 
he's not going to be able to pull a lot of the same stunts he was uh, pulling when he first got in. But who knows? He might be able to uh, pull some stuff that people aren't going to be looking for. But, yeah, people are going to be watching him like a hawk. So look out for that. I think the biggest thing that the, the jury's still out to prove here is the pitching staff. You know, the pitching staff still looks a little shaky. Uh, Rodriguez, Eduardo Rodriguez is now on the disabled list to start the season. So that's not a good thing for the team. But they do have some guys. Uh, Tanner Rourke is one of the names um, I'm looking for some sort of good production from him this season. He's expected to do really well. I know they want to start him with the Woo Sox. Remember, there's no more Pawtucket Red Sox. It's now the Worcester Red Sox or the Woo Sox. So they want him to develop his uh, third pitch down there. So he's going to be bouncing back a little bit, uh, you know, doing the uh, Worcester Express train kind of uh, season that he'll have. But if he's coming up, he's going to be starting in place of Rodriguez on Saturday now. He pitches well. I mean, it's going to make – it's going to make it very hard to tell him to go back down to um, to Worcester to, um, to to pitch. So we'll have to see what happens on that front for uh, for Tanner Rook. They have uh, Nathan Avaldi. They have Martin Perez. I need to see more of what he's going to do. We saw him last year. He's an average pitcher. Very likable, very likable person, but I need to see more of what he's going to do. Uh, Nick Pavetta, a guy that they got for Brandon Workman, and there was another body that they sent to the Phillies last uh, spring, um, Heath Hembry. So Pavetta is in the rotation. And then you have Chris Sale potentially coming back for um, the second half of the season, maybe earlier. So we'll and see. And new guy they didn't expect, though. They're, they're uh, even I'll mute myself now. Um, and that guy... That guy that needed that, that they didn't even expect. Uh, they thought he was going to be a long shot, and they ended up bringing him up to the team. Didn't even pitch in the preseason or anything. Started with the W. It was like Whit, Whitaker, Whitaker or something. Whittinger. It's the guy that they brought up. Uh, he came from the Yankees when we got Adam Ottavino. He was the throw in. So he had a really good spring training and i think that it'll be good to uh see him produce and do something nice there too any other things on baseball before we wrap that up all right awesome i want to go to the bruins next because i am concerned i saw a really weird stat uh, after the shootout win that they got on tuesday night they are they are three one and one in their last five games doesn't feel like that to me at all. Doesn't feel like that. I am concerned with the Bruins. It's health. It's getting production. They're not getting anything from Krejci. They're not getting anything from Poster now. They're not getting anything from Bergeron. It seems like this entire team right now is driven by Martian and the goaltending, depending upon who's in net from everything. But I'm, I'm, I'm definitely concerned. The good thing, Brandon Collar returned from injury on Tuesday night's game and was, uh, they, they needed him badly and he did a nice job. I'm still very concerned with the defense though. I think we're starting to see a lot of growing pains with Jeremy liaison. I am not liking his play as of late. I don't, I think in a way, Charlie, Co um, not Coyle, uh, Charlie McAvoy he started out gangbusters, kind of tailed off a little bit. Now, I'm seeing him on the ice for a lot of goals given up, and I'm, I'm concerned on that front. You're seeing more playing time from Stephen Camper. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I guess it's good that John Moore's not in the lineup, so I guess I'll take it. But I, th this team needs a kick in the butt. It needs a kick in the butt. It needs a big-time addition. I feel like it's deja vu. I feel like we've been saying this for the past four or five years now. Our second line can't get the job done consistently. It just can't. You got Debrusco still in COVID per, uh, restriction. You aren't getting anything from Krejci. You're not getting anything from Bjork. You're not getting anything uh, too elaborate from really anybody else. I guess the best player you can say on the second line right now, Tom, I would probably be uh, Nick Ritchie. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, again, I <laughs> haven't been able to watch the Bruins since uh, a week and a half ago, really. So I don't – I mean, it, the games don't look like they're uh, turning out the way they want them. Um, but, yeah, secondary scoring is always a big a big plus for teams. And, uh, I mean, the goal – it's tough with Rask out too because now, now you have to rely a lot on Halak, and I haven't seen how he's been playing since Rask hasn't been able to play. But I'm sure it can't be that good if they're giving up three, four goals in a game. Um, but they do, they need to, uh, they need to figure something out. They have, uh, they have 11 days, um, until the trade deadline is, uh, comes up. So we'll see. They should be, they, hopefully they can make some big moves. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned the trade, uh, you mentioned the trade deadline and the, it's very important that they make a move. Will they do a, will they make a big splash? I don't know who's out there. I, I really don't. I don't know what you can get with what you have in house right now. I do think that we have a little bit too many young guys right now, but it, it, you're going to have to package something. Maybe you get Bjork or St- Studnicka. I haven't, where has he been in the lineup? Haven't used him. So if you're not going to use him, get him out of here. Like, what are you, what are you waiting for? Um, I, I, I think that we have some good players upcoming, but no one's setting the world on fire to me. So that means that you need to make a move and the move needs to be done. Now I'm getting real tired of the same old song and dance. We can't score full strength. We are out this certain player. We have to have another person step in. There's just no consistency right now at all. The power play is another thing I'm extremely concerned about. It looks slow. It looks uh, kind of lame. It looks like there needs to be a change somewhere on it. It's been Bergeron, Marshawn, and Pasternik for a long time. I know that Cassidy has put Krejci out there on times where you eliminate one of the defensemen and throw um, another uh, forward out there into that unit. I'd entertain that, but I might want to throw in like a Charlie Coyle or maybe a a Nick Ritchie at some point to get some spark and to get some kind of productive scoring uh, going. I just think that what you're seeing with David Krejci is just a a lost cause, I think right now. And I don't, I don't want to have to call him out because he's done. uh, He's had a great career with the Bruins, especially in the playoffs when it matters. But right now you only got one goal on the season. That's embarrassing. That's got to change. So I think that if if you can start, maybe this game on Tuesday night that they just had was a confidence builder. Maybe we'll see a better team come out against Pittsburgh on this Thursday night game that they have next. That's what I'm hoping for. Um, yeah, it's a. I mean, it's a. It's a better team. It's a stronger team. So, I mean, the way the way the pattern goes with Boston and New England teams is, the better the team, the better they'll play. Um, but I mean, who knows? With the way the way the games have been going, and how close they are, they need something. They need a jump start today. Um, so hopefully, they can get something going against a, a decent team that hasn't been playing well this year. Um, but that they can hopefully play against, play better against than they have against other, the teams they've been playing recently. I think the good news is they don't have to face the Devils again. I mean, they're God. I mean, how many times can you lose to the the Devils and the Sabres and all this crap teams? It's like you're playing down to their level for some reason. It just it's it's mind boggling to me. Speaking of playing down to levels, let's go over to the Boston Celtics. There comes our our lovely Green Hornet, Phil Healy, right there. Mm-hmm. And I guess the question here is. You got Fournier. You've got um, the new uh, Hornet guy, whatever is Evan Hornet. Is that his name? No, Cornet. You have Wagner, Cornet. And yeah, I believe that's what you got for uh, Jeff Teague, Daniel uh, Tice, Daniel Tice and and Javante uh, Green. Javante Green. Oh, and actually, Jeff Teague was in the Fournier uh, one. But yeah. I know that the Celtics are trying to get better. I understand that. 
Um, I know they're entertaining the buyout market. I know that Marcus Cousins' name has been out there. I'd entertain it. It gives them another person who's a veteran kind of kind of person in there. They missed out on. I just went to the Lakers. What's his name? You have Andre 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 Drummond went to the Lakers. Lamarcus we Aldridge went Drummond. to Brooklyn. Yep. Yep. So it's an arms race between the Lakers and Brooklyn. Yep. And you know Brooklyn already has. Um, what was it they have? Uh, what's his name? Former LA guy. Former Clipper guy. Oh, uh, I forget. But then they got uh, Griffin. Uh, but the, their original center is actually pretty good. So they got Griffin, they got Aldridge, and they have this um, uh, their original center who was uh, played for the Clippers and is like a rebound machine and defensively pretty good. But uh, yeah, I don't. Your question, I imagine, do you think they got better? What's your actual question? No. I, I, did you do you think they got better from from this trade? Uh, I mean, I don't know. I uh, Fournier is a, it's a good touch to have another scorer like that off the bench. He played okay D last night. It wasn't bad. I, I mean, I don't know if you've watched any of the last two games. Well, I've actually watched a little bit of it. I actually have to criticize uh, Jason Tatum, and he didn't have he didn't have bad games per se the last two games. But when they needed him the most, when they needed him to hit a shot, he he couldn't. And I think that's that's a syndrome of this team. Like when they need a bucket. And they get so close and they, they let teams like walk all over them and then they climb back and Hey, you know, kudos to them. They were able to fight back, but they weren't able to seal the deal. And Tatum, when he came in, the Celtics were on a run. I think they were down four. And then like the first offensive series he came in on, he was the weak link and he played a little better after that. But like, I don't know. He, sometimes it feels like, they got something going and then he'll come in and it's just kind of, he's like, you know what? I should get these calls. I should get blah, blah, blah. And he, he, sometimes he makes up for that, but sometimes when there's little to no room for error towards the end of these games, which they put themselves in to begin with, which they shouldn't be in this position. Uh, it costs them. So, I mean, long and short of it, Tatum needs to be kind of tighter at the end of these games. And sometimes he's, he's fantastic, but you know, I, I saw a couple of plays last time. I'm like, ugh. And it's just the whole team just needs to – they're giving – when they give a crap and they, they, like, kind of honker down and play defense. And that's all I've been saying all for – I don't know how many episodes I have to say it, but they just need to care and play defense because shootouts shouldn't be what they're looking to win. But at, at. Like, they shouldn't be able to – they shouldn't, like, rest their laurels on winning a shootout because you're, you're not going to do it. You're not going to win it all the time. And, and B, you become a lot – you come quite a more complete team and a better team if you know how to play defense and just kind of grind one out. But I don't know. I don't know. I think they made a trade just kind of to make a trade, just to change some things up. I don't think that Fournier was like this big thing, like, oh, we have to have him or something Mm -hmm. like that. I think they just made a trade to kind of make a trade. I don't think it's a bad trade, but I don't think Fournier is here for long. I think it's a rental. No, no, that's – yeah, we'll see. I mean, yeah. We'll have to see. I mean, obviously, if he comes out and does a great job, and he's been doing great with three-pointer game, but I think that's the biggest problem here on the Celtics. I even – I criticize Brian Scalabrini a lot when he's on these broadcasts. I think that he's the biggest homer that there is in professional sports, but I will yeah, have I to actually say don't. I, oh, go ahead. I'll have to agree with what he said last night. Too many threes drive to the hoop. It's getting to the point where – they just feel like getting a three instead of getting the two points when you can get back into these games uh, is the way to go. If they oh, get themselves yeah. all out of whack, I think, if they think, oh, I'm just going to sit here at the three and miss a million times. I think well, that's it, a, Marcus Smart's got a big issue with that. I think Tatum does a lot. Same with Brown. And I think those three, if they continue to play with that mindset, you're going to be born losers, and you are not going to win a championship. So I think they need to know – it's like I don't a know. team. You got you got to buy into the team team kind of basketball. Yeah, I, I think, think they they're do. more selfish in a way. Yeah, kind of. I mean, I wish it were that simple. Uh, I, I think it's more or less like it depends on what opponent they're playing and what they're allowed and what they can do. I think last night was a good example of like Scalabrina, as you said, as Scal said it, like they need to be driving the hoop a little more. And when they were, they were getting more results. Either getting you know that kind of those two points or kicking it back out to someone who might be wide open. And that is not going to happen with every team. And Dallas is a little bit bigger. And they were playing big a little earlier, which didn't allow them to drive the hoop that much. 
but it's it's all about ball movement and knowing what the other team will give you. It's just like you know any sort of sport, like taking what you you can get and trying not to force as much. And you know there'll be nights when they can just uh, they won't be able to drive as much because they'll just be like you know a for like just you know just like a forest down in in um, in the paint like uh, with uh, with the Bucks and whatnot and some other teams and also he didn't have Robert Williams last night which I guess it was a late night uh, late scratch Thank but you for bringing that up that is correct he did not and he's a, been playing great I mean he's been playing great this whole year and maybe that makes you better that's the result of why Tice is gone is because yeah. of Williams so yeah. They're banking on him. Yeah, and he's a young guy, and he'll be there for a bit. But, I mean, I guess to your earlier question, you're not wrong in some cases when they're, you know, sometimes they might chuck up some threes. Uh, but a lot of times it's, you know, figure out what you need to do in that situation and, you know, take advantage of it. And sometimes they don't do that. And also just play, like, if you play better defense, you might not be in these positions. And was it against uh, New Orleans, against the Pelicans, it was one of the last plays of the game, handful of possessions where uh, I don't know if you saw it, but Marcus Smart, uh, you know, he, they do the thing where the inbound Pelicans had the ball. Marcus Smart gets hit in a moving pick by uh, Stephen Adams, and he does that a good amount of time. He does that successfully a lot of times, and the play was a foul. The guy got Marcus Smart got fouled. They didn't call it. They didn't refs didn't bite. Now, what happened, and that was actually, I'm sorry, Pel- not the Pelicans, but the Celtics were inbounding it. And when that happens, you get one free free, uh, free throw uh, and the ball. But what happened is it didn't happen, and the Celtics didn't know what to do. It seemed like they didn't know what the hell to do right after it. And maybe they were informed. Maybe they did have a plan, but it didn't seem it. And I like, that's on Brad Stevens. Like, you know, he can't just bank on that one thing. And if that was the case, then they didn't really have a backup for that, then that's kind of weird. Did you um, get a chance to hear a little bit of the uh... – a post-game press conference with Stevens. Or here. I I heard someone talking about it, and I saw like a second of it, and it was kind of like the first time that he actually showed some frustration and showed yeah. that this is unacceptable. We know he's not the fiery type. Some guys are like Bruce Cassidy is a fiery type. He tells it like it is. He calls a spade a spade, and that's what I like a lot about them. I think. The John Farrell, the, the the Brad Stevens, the Claude Julian school of coaching, it doesn't relate well to me. It's more, oh, yeah, we'll do better next time. Oh, we'll be fine. I believe in these guys, bah, bah, bah. It's like they sugarcoat it. Well, Brad didn't sugarcoat anything last night. He goes, our guys that we count on didn't step up. It's happening repeatedly, and it needs to stop. And it needs to be better now. Like I'm done playing games, basically, is what he said. No, yeah, it's great. He's right. He's 100 percent right. Today. I actually want to say congratulations for finally putting on your big boy pants and telling these this this, this group of basketball players that what they're doing is unacceptable. They need to go out and they need to play hard. So it took a lot. I saw on your face. And your body language took you a lot to say these group of basketball players. I did. <laughs> like, I know you had something else. I did. But uh, that, thank you for restraint. I'm, I'm restraining uh, myself. You know, you know, uh, I, I might feel different inside, but I, I know I speak what I speak. <laughs> uh, well, those jerks better listen loud and clear. I'll say it. I'll use that's the PG derogatory version, term. but sure, that works. Too. Uh, no, <laughs> yeah, I, I listen. I, you're right. And it's great that Stevens came out like that to say that. But, I mean, it's still, I don't know, that play, whether it was something they just didn't know what to do and they didn't follow his directions or they didn't really have a backup plan for the Pelican game. But, no. I don't think they had a backup plan. I think they were kind of winging it and just going with whatever. Well, going with the initial plan, but that fell through. What do you do? Uh, But I do agree with you, and I'm glad he said something because that's exactly what I said. Uh, Tatum needs to step up. There are a bunch of shots he should have took or uh, followed through with that, you know, he's a superstar. He should make them. But that's that. Phil and I agree on a Celtics discussion. It's just that's not an April Fool's joke. That's on part true. of it, yeah, it's it's completely the truth. We yeah. rarely fully disagree. I'll say that. Hold on, one and second. then no worries. Let's go to Tom. <laughs> and hello, me. Celtics. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean they're just a. Like, 
Not that you know, I'll be the negative Nancy today. You know, they're, they're, just, a, they're just a junk team, a garbage <laughs> team. They can't get anything done, and uh, I yeah, think, just look, awful. I don't know. <laughs> Brad Stevens is the worst. Brad Stevens is the worst coach on the planet. Can't get the job done. Needs to be that, fired. Danny Ainge needs the axe. Oh my lord. You're coming down. I I can't, I can't hear you, Phil. Unfortunately, so whatever you're saying. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, let me. Really? I thought you don't have anything going. But uh, hold on. Well, I'll say it. Maybe you'll get. Danny it. Ainge needs the axe. He needs to figure something else, or he needs to. He needs to be out of there. Let me chat with you here. Uh, I actually think if they were a junk team, uh, then it would make it all the more. I mean, it would be easier to accept all this. But they're not a junk team. Unfortunately, they're not a junk team. They're actually a pretty talented – they have a talented enough roster to be far better than what they're doing now. And that's, that's the – that is the depressing part of it. And it isn't a matter of like, well, who are you going to get to fix all this? It's like, yeah, like you need defender – you need to get them to defend better and maybe another or two lockdown defenders. I, I say this every freaking episode, <laughs> but like, yeah, you need – the defense is what's going to win it for you. Look at the Lakers in the finals last year. Look at their game six. They uh, like they held down Miami. I think it was like the sixty something points or something. It was something ridiculous. When you you become a better, much better team when you're able to play lockdown defense. It's like that. Just I'm going to agree again here with you, Phil. I'm going to agree. It's not a matter of them being a junk team. I don't think so. <laughs> it's a matter of them actually having the talent. And it's a matter of them not achieving what we were expecting, basically. We, we've, we've seen this team get all the way to the Eastern Conference Finals, lose to the, you know, what, what, I think it was the Cavs at one point, or now last year it was losing to, um, or was it the Magic? No. Uh, no Miami, Miami, close enough. Miami. I knew it was a Florida team. It was team. a Florida team, yeah. Yeah. Um, but they, they, they have a team that can do it. To see them regress this year with pretty much the same outside of like Gordon Hayward, uh, for an example, it's it doesn't sit right with fans. And that's how it is for me. I think because our expectation was so high to see it kind of come crashing down, it just adds on to the 2020 theme of how the year was. You know, it sucked. And I don't think people want to see this team exceed expectations and do well. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah. But yeah, I mean, that's 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 like a lot of teams are you know look good on paper. I mean, the so this this team, it's pretty much been this team for what three years now, three seasons, three four seasons, pretty much. Um, and, and Iterations been, of it, yeah, I guess. I mean, you've had Brown. This is Brown, I think, fifth season, I think. Uh, fourth or fifth. Shows how much I know about basketball. <laughs> no, no, I think no, I think this is Brown's fifth. And I think this is Tatum's fourth. I mean, you've had, you've had them a lot. Now this, I think this is the first year. You maybe the second, you could say, but really the first year. This is their team. Um, and you know, it's it, it's not even just them, Tatum and Brown. I mean, Kemba. I love Kemba. Like last night, there was just a part where he let. Uh, I think Bustlin, one of the guards for the Mavs, just get in front of them and score. And they were down by – C's were down by two. And there was, like, I think, like, under a minute left. And they just needed this other one – this additional stop. And he just lets the guy get in front of him. And not to say the uh, their guard, the Dallas guard, wasn't that good. I mean, he, he was playing solid all game and fundamentally strong all game. But Kemba couldn't – just he made a – he made a bad move and – and open things up, and just stuff like that. It's you so frustrated. Where even against the Bucks, that first game they they lost by. Um, actually, they came back in that one too, um, they and they lost by game. two. They lost by two. Oh, that's right. They lost by two against um, the Bucks in that game. They did and, in that game. That's correct. Yeah, and yeah, they were just like they left Bledsoe open for kickout threes for like three or four possessions, and that killed them. And just kind of like they commit. Like, it's not just playing, like, playing smart defense, I guess. I mean, it's easier said than done. And you just more, you need more people kind of on that level. But yeah, all right. I'll stop talking about the Celtics because it's more. <laughs> the last more thing I wanted to mention uh, here today was the, uh, the Patriots. I don't know if you guys knew, but uh, Robert Kraft came out and said that 
he's very happy with what they've done so far this off season. The big thing is that he feels that Cam Newton didn't have the weapons and the tools from last year. So I didn't really love what he had to say, but then I got a chance to think about it a little bit more. And it's a smart thing to say because it's not now it's telling other teams that, okay, well, maybe we are going to have Cam Newton. It's, it's leaving it open ended because I don't feel like they're comfortable still with Newton as their quarterback. I mean, another week has gone by, and I still feel that it's Garoppolo or nothing for this team right now. I think that that's the mindset that they have. The question is, I don't know if you guys have thought about it yet, but, you know, Garoppolo's not super durable. He hasn't shown that he's been able to play a whole successful season and stay healthy. Well, you have an insurance policy. Maybe it's a little bit expensive, but... If you have Garoppolo and Newton on the same roster, I think those two can correlate together. So I also think, and I, I've been, this isn't an April Fool's joke. I think that they also might have some sort of trick kind of plan to, if Garoppolo is the quarterback, can Newton do something else and still be a useful kind of football player? I've heard a couple people mention it. You know, he's got his quick legs and everything like that. Is there some sort of thing where, where you could see him slide into some sort of another kind of role, like a versatile uh, position of some sorts? Just a thought. I'll let you guys uh, determine that next. Well, I will add that um, San Francisco also the other day, either yesterday or a couple of days ago, um, released their – part of their asking price for a Jimmy Garoppolo trade. So it also looks like, you know, because of the rumors floating around, but it looks like that San Francisco might actually consider it. Um, and they're, they're looking for at least a first round pick uh, first round pick and a couple other things. Um, but I mean, I don't, I could see either new cam or Jimmy being used as a vers versatile option. Um, whether it's a receiver or some sort of running back or a screen screen receiver or something, um, wouldn't when when shock me, really. It's just a matter of how good their hands are, I guess. But or you know, you know, one of them could be thrown in for a trick play. And you could you could have uh, Garoppolo be thrown in for a uh, one of those uh, quarterback turn into a receiver uh, toss back to a wide wide receiver kind of trick play that the Patriots have pulled a couple of times, I mean, but you never know. I don't know. You I, never know I'm, with the Patriots. I am never putting Garoppolo out there as a receiver because I, he will break in half from one, from one, I, from everything. I mean, I think that's, I think it's a great idea, but I don't know. I mean, how many times has he been injured? Tw uh, two or three times, I think. Yeah. But I don't know. That's the thing that gets me too. When they talk about trading for Garoppolo and they're like, Oh, that's not a bad idea. And that's, you know, kind of him coming home is not a bad story. And maybe you have him for another like five to seven years, maybe. Cause was he 29 or 28? He's, He's like 29. 29. So who knows how long you have him for. Uh, but I don't, and I think Tom said last time, like I'm more falling in love with them drafting a young guy and then just kind of running with it. But you know what, if you get, I don't know. Say you trade Cam or you do something else. You throw Cam in with something. Uh, like I mean, I, could, I mean, I see where uh, Kraft is coming from, though, too. I mean, he didn't have the weapons last year, really, if you think about it. No, he didn't. But now, now you're throwing in a couple tight ends that are actually really good. Um, you got, you still got James White coming back. So you have, you have a lot of things lining up for the offense, even if you do end up keep you know holding on to Cam for at quarterback, even if he does end up starting. Um, but it would be nice to have a quarterback that can actually throw the ball a fair a fair distance instead of just five, 10 yards, 15 yards. Um, but who knows? You know, and like I said, you never know with the Patriots. So it's just a theory. I don't know if the theory could be right or not, but I still gun to my head. Garoppolo is my quarterback week one. They're going to figure out some sort of way to make it happen. So I don't think the Patriots are done 
this off season yet with figuring out some other things. I don't care what other reports are out there. They are not going with as their primary starting quarterback, Cam Newton for next year. That's just my take. Anything else before we wrap up today? Uh, no. Definitely I a wish the Expos were coming back. I apologize yeah. for the weirdness. It just happens. Some days no, are busier right. than others, and sometimes you just can't make certain things happen. So we are flexible. We accommodate. Yes, Thomas behind the gray wall right there. That's how we're doing it for today. So we hope you enjoyed our program for uh, today. Happy April again to all of our friends out there. And good luck to the Red Sox who start their season uh, this week. We are hopeful that the Bruins will return to being more consistent, being a team that is right up there towards the top of the NHL where they belong in their conversation. Celtics, we just hope the season ends tomorrow. So just put out there. No. <laughs> And then we hope for the Patriots to uh, continue to make some moves to get the team better for the 2021 season. So for Nick Face and Tom Smith and Phil Healy, I thank you guys for being here today on Face to Facts. We will see you here again for another episode, most likely where Tom is in another place. And I'll be here. I'll we'll stay see. here. We'll, we'll see. see. We'll see how it goes. See you guys later. <laughs>